Well, good morning. Oh, that was good. Uh, my name is Todd Malone. I'm the uh, lead pastor here at FBC. And uh, let me start by asking a couple of important questions. Um, youth who went on the retreat, good retreat? Excellent. <laughs> um, are you guys wiped out? Are you guys going to go home and take naps? And all your parents said amen. <laughs> so, um, I hear it was a fantastic, fantastic retreat. And um, on the behalf of the youth, I want to say thank you to all of those who uh, faithfully served in making that possible in one way or the other. Um, these things are life-changing. And that's... Uh, <clears throat> I wish a whole bunch of other people could have t-shirts as well because you were a part of what God did this weekend. So thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to admit to something I probably should not admit to. Uh, this is one of my favorite books, Frankenstein. Now, <laughs> um, if all you have seen are the movies, then you probably don't really know what the novel is about. The movies tend to miss it completely. One of maybe the core theme of the novel Frankenstein is loneliness. And if all you have ever seen is the movie versions you would never, ever pick that up. Let me give you a summary of what happens in the book. Dr. Frankenstein creates this creature. By the way, to reinforce that this is about loneliness, the creature is never given a name. He is nameless. And by the way, Frankenstein is not the monster. Frankenstein is the guy who creates the monster. Um, Dr. Frankenstein creates this creature because what he's trying to do is find a cure for death. And as soon as he creates this creature, he looks at this creature and he is horrified. He is repulsed by what he has created and he abandons this creature. And this creature, ugly and deformed, monstrous in size and power is left alone to try to navigate life by himself. And all this creature wants is companionship. A critical point in the novel comes where the creature confronts his maker. And by the way, the creature is not someone who just grunts and has his arms out in front of him. He actually gives like these eloquent speeches. Um, now, I know I'm going to get asked the question because, yes, I have seen young Frankenstein. No, at no point in the movie does he put on a top hat and sing Putting on the Ritz. Um, but he's very intelligent and he's very articulate and he confronts his maker and he confronts his maker with an ultimatum and he says, you must make for me a companion. That is all he wants. He just wants someone who will look at him and not be repulsed. Someone who will, who will love him and accept his love. And his maker, Dr. Frankenstein, refuses. And the, this creature falls into absolute despair because he will never know the types of relationships that he wants to know, that he longs for so deeply, and that is what turns him into the monster and causes him to try to destroy both his creator and those that are closest to him. And I think this novel has had lasting power because this novel is not a horror story about a monster. This novel is a picture of of our souls deep deep inside of us we have what this creature longed for we have the longing 
that we would experience, that we would know what it is to be seen in all of our ugliness and to be loved, to be able to give love and to receive love. And yet what we also often experience is the sense that we will never, ever really experience that. I remember being in a traffic jam in Southern California, feeling absolutely, completely alone. I felt abandoned by God. I felt like there was no one in my life who loved me and supported me. I was alone in this emptiness of the universe and an emptiness that was inside of me. And longing to connect, longing to not be alone. And I think what was happening is that longing that is inside of each one of us, that churns inside of each one of us, was bubbling up to the top in a way that was monstrous. When we come to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, what Paul is telling us is we are not alone. We are not alone abandoned by God and by others. But to tell us that, he's going to back up and he's going to say, at one point you were alienated. You were hopelessly alienated. But that is not your situation now. Your situation now is that there has been reconciliation. Peace has been made. And that is going to create a whole new type of community and relationships with other people. Well, let's back up and remember um, a little bit about what's going on in the book of Ephesians. Now, as we've said before, Ephesus, which is where the church uh, that Paul is writing to was, was a very important city in the Roman Empire. Now, you can see it a little better on this map than the map that we've used in the past, but Ephesus was a port city. And it was a city where a lot of of business took place. It was a financial banking city. And because it was a port city, goods would come into the Roman Empire through Ephesus. And that made it a very cosmopolitan city. What I mean by that is it was a city with all kinds of different people and it was very sophisticated. In fact, this is the ruin of, um, if I can get this to work. This is the ruin of the theater in Ephesus. This theater sat 25,000 people. Let me give you some perspective on that. Been to the Belcher Center at Letourneau? That seats 2,000 people. So when Paul was writing this, there was a theater that was right down the road from the people he was writing to that was 12 and a half times larger than the Belcher Center. This was a community where people from all over the the known world would come for work, for business, for entertainment. This is a place where people would gather from all kinds of backgrounds. And that is exactly the community of Christians that Paul is writing to. The Ephesian church is a mix of people that reflected their city. And the most important type of mix that Paul has to address and that he addresses in today's passage is that there were both Jews and Gentiles. Jews were the people that had been chosen by God. They were God's people chosen by him to tell the entire world about God. And Gentiles were the people they were supposed to tell. They were supposed to be blessed by the Jews. But you know what? The Jews came to look down on them as a source of cursing. They looked at the Gentiles and they said, we're not going to be a blessing to you because you are a curse to us. And so Jews looked down on Gentiles and even despised them. And Paul writes to a church that is filled with these two groups. And he must help them navigate. He must help them function as one community. And as we've seen, as we've gone through the book of Ephesians, Paul's strategy at this point is not to give them a to-do list. Paul's strategy at this point is to help them think and value how they should think and what they should value. And so this chart will become familiar to you. In the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, what we see 
is that Paul is laying out, this is what God has done. And then in the last half of Ephesians, he's going to lay out, and now in response, this is what you are to do. And we saw in week one that what God has done is that he he has united all things. And that leads into a prayer that Paul has that the Ephesians would come to know God deeply, personally, intimately. And then Paul explains to them that what God has done is he's taken them when they were spiritually dead and he has made them alive. And did you notice when Lauren read the passage, what the first word of the passage was. Therefore, because this is true, now Paul is going to explain something in today's passage. Because God has taken people who are spiritually dead and made them spiritually alive, Paul is going to explain that this is how you relate to one another. This is what is true of you as a community of believers. And what he's going to say is he has taken those who were far off from God and from the people of God, and he has drawn them close. Now, for Paul to draw out the implications of what he said last week in in God making dead people alive, for him to really explain that, he's going to have to go back again, and he's going to have to explain, this is who you were, this is what it was like before you knew Christ. And what he explains is that they were a people in hopeless alienation. Now, for us to really unpack this, it actually helps for us to start in verse 12, because in verse 12, he gives a list of what was once true of of the Ephesians. And the first thing that he says that was once true of them is that they had been separated from Christ. What does that mean? Remember, Christ is the Greek word for a Hebrew concept. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew idea of Messiah. And the Jews lived hoping, waiting that someday Messiah would come and free them from oppression and free them as a people. And they lived in that hope of deliverance that would come through the Messiah. But the Gentiles did not have the Old Testament. They did not have this hope of deliverance. They did not have this concept that someday God was going to deliver. Second thing it says about them is that they were alienated. From the commonwealth of Israel. Alienated literally means, the Greek word literally means to be estranged, to be excluded. And you see, God was building a people in the Jews. He was building a nation. And these were a unique people, specifically and specially related to God. And the Gentiles had been excluded from that. God is building a nation and the Gentiles were not a part of that nation. Then he describes them as strangers to the covenant of promise. You see, as part of God building this nation, God had promises that he made this nation. He had ways of relating to them that were unique to them, ways that he would bless them that were unique to them. And Paul is reminding the Gentiles that there was a day When you were not a part of any of those blessings, you were excluded from God's promises and God's blessings to his people. And then he gives this summary statement of what they were like. He says, you are without hope and without God in the world. They had no objective basis whatsoever for having hope. They did not know the true God, who he was, what he was like what he was doing. So what Paul is saying in in verse 12 is that the Ephesians were outsiders. They didn't know God's deliverance. They They were not a part of God's people that he was building. They were excluded from God's promises to those people, and they were a people without hope. And then if you put that in the context of verse 11, what he is saying in verse 11 is basically this. Not only were all those things true about you, But you know what? The Jews didn't like you. The Jews despised you. You see, the Jews defined the Gentiles by the fact that they were outsiders to God's people. When he talks about 
that they were called the uncircumcision by those who were called the circumcision. Those called the circumcision, that's a way of talking about the Jews. Well, why does Paul put it that way? Because circumcision was one of the things that the Jews did that marked them as a unique people. There were other things like keeping the Sabbath, ways that they would be purified that said, this is what marks you as a unique people. But unfortunately, those things that, were, that marked them as a unique people became a source of pride and became a source of looking down on others. How do I know that? Because of this word right here. They were called the uncircumcision. The Greek word that's translated there is not a word you would use in polite company. It is a graphic word. It is a condescending word. It is derogatory in very, very specific ways. And what Paul wants them to remember, what Paul wants them to understand, is that there was a time before they knew Christ when they were a people who were despised by the people of God. Here's something else that's interesting. This word right there, remember, is a command. And it is the only command in the first three chapters of Ephesians. The only command that Paul gives in the first three chapters of Ephesians is remember who you were. When we think of the word remember, very often what we think of is the ability to recall facts, right? I want to make sure that I pass the, the test. I want to make sure that I get everything right on the quiz so I can recall the facts. But that is not what the Bible means when it uses remember terminology. It is the idea of keeping in front of you, keeping sight of what is true from the past so it governs how you live today. That's why Jesus says when he institutes communion, do this in remembrance of me. It's not just so we, will, we won't forget about Jesus. It's so that we will bring in front of ourselves, lock into our minds the truth about who Jesus is and what he has done so that it affects how we live today. And Paul says, I want you to remember, lock in, keep in front of you. Don't lose sight of who you once were. You were alienated and you were treated as people who were alienated. This is a truth, I don't know about you, but it is a truth that for me is hard to accept. Because I came to Christ when I was six years old. And it never occurred to me that I was a person alienated from the people of God. It never occurred to me that I was an outsider. And I grew up not thinking about the fact that I was once an outsider to the people of God. But Paul says, you need to lock this truth into your minds because it is what is true. Even if you never experienced it as a young child or before you came to Christ, it is the truth. And when I experience moments like feeling totally isolated and alone in the middle of a traffic jam in Los Angeles... It's one of those moments that reminds me that inside of me there is unfinished business from living in a fallen world. There is still a churning of loneliness that reminds me that I am longing for more. And that's where Paul goes next. Paul wants us not only to remember that we were once hopelessly alienated, but he wants us to remember the provision for peaceful reconciliation that is in Christ. If you were here last week, one of the things you remember is there's a point in the middle of the passage where Paul has talked about all the different ways that they are spiritually dead, all the different signs of that. They are alienated from God. And then right in the middle of the passage, he has two words, but God. And what follows that is a description of God's mercy. 
He's doing the exact same thing here in this passage. He's described all the ways that before Christ we were alienated from God and one another. And then he gives this pivot point where he says, but now. But now. And here's the key to the whole passage. You have been brought near. But now you who are alienated have been reconciled and you have been brought near. And what has brought them near is the cross. It is the blood of Christ. What has brought them near is the fact that they are in unity with Christ and that allows them to be in unity with one another. They have been placed, it says, in Christ Jesus. That means they are in a living, dynamic relationship with Jesus. And because they are in Christ, they are now close to God and united with his people. And what Paul develops in the rest of verses 14 through 18 is the explanation of how this works. Paul says that we, that he himself, Christ, is our peace. When we think of peace, what do we think of? We think of the absence of war, the absence of conflict. In the Bible, that's a part of peace, but that's only one part of peace. In the Bible, peace, shalom, is the idea of, of thriving, of flourishing. And Paul says that Jesus is our peace. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is both the cause, the source of our peace, and he is the condition in which we have peace. This is going to be a bad example, but it's the best I could come up with. Think about a flower. Think about what is necessary for a flower to grow and to live. It must have soil. When you put a seed in soil, then it has a chance. That soil becomes a source of life for that seed. But if you remove that flower from the soil, the flower will not continue to live. The soil is both a source of life and it is the ongoing condition of life for that flower. Jesus is both the source and the condition for the peace that we have with one another and with God. And this chart kind of helps us explain exactly how this works. You will notice that um, I did not attempt to draw stick figures up here because, as my wife can tell you, I can't. Um, I'm a stick figure disaster. But here's what this chart represents. You've got Jews, and you've got Gentiles, and they're divided by a wall. And I, okay, yeah, I know you can't read my writing either. That's okay. <laughs> um, but you get the idea. And so here's the idea. Here's how this worked. If a Gentile was going to enter into a relationship with God, what that meant was becoming part of the people of God. In the Bible, those two are not separated. You can't separate being in relationship with God from being a part of the people of God. That just was not a concept that existed. And so if they were going to do that, if a Gentile was going to become a part of the people of God, they had to climb the wall. What does it mean to climb the wall? They basically had to stop being Gentiles. They had to adopt the, the rituals, the commandments, the ordinances of what it meant to be a Jew. So they would have to start practicing Sabbath. They would have to start practicing the, the, the acts of purity. They would have to start following the commands. The only path to unity with God was to climb the wall and be on the other side to stop being a Gentile and start being a Jew. And what Jesus is saying in the verse is that's not how it works anymore. What Jesus is saying in these verses is that what he has come to do is tear down that wall. There is a new way that all of this works. And it's this. You are in Christ and so Gentiles now can be in Christ, and Jews can be in Christ. And this status of being in Christ 
is now how you experience oneness. It is no longer climbing the wall. You are not defined as the people of God by following Jewish rules, but by being in Christ. So why do Christians today in this room feel isolated and alone? Because we are really good at rebuilding walls. Sometimes there are walls that we build to keep out others. Sometimes there are walls that we build to keep others away from us. And we send the message loud and clear that unless you climb the wall that I have built and become just like me, you are not welcome in community. Right? Have you seen that? Someone who, who has a certain appearance, maybe it's tattoos or lack of tattoos, maybe it's clothes that they wear or hairstyle, that is too different. You are not welcome in community. Maybe it's what they post on Facebook. Maybe it's who they vote for. Maybe it's how they worship. And we build these walls that say, if you fall in that category, you are not a part of our people. When we do this, what do we believe our peace is based on? We believe that our peace is based on people thinking just like me. People looking just like me. People having the same preferences that I have. Or maybe we turn it around and we say, peace comes from no one being able to see my ugliness. And so I will hide behind the walls that I build. Well, what does Paul mean when he says that Jesus is our peace? How does that work? It really comes down to understanding verse 16. The hostilities that existed between one another have been pulled down and the hostilities between us and God have been killed. And what has done that is the cross. Through Christ, what has separated us from God and what separates us from one another has been removed. How does that work in our relationships? I want you to think about what the love of God is and what it looks like. And I'll say this a lot because I want you to be able to quote this in your sleep. Love is defined as the desire for unity with the other and desire for their good. And what God did is he desired unity with us and our good so much so that he pursued it sacrificially at extraordinary cost to himself. And that is how we are to love one another, even if they are ugly and disagreeable. We are to love one another the way we have been loved by God who looked at our ugliness and our sin and everything about us that he had every right to reject us. And he said, instead what I will do is I'm going to pursue relationship with you at great sacrificial cost to myself. He said, instead, I will pursue your good, your well-being at great sacrificial cost to myself. And he looks at us and says, that is the love I want you to overflow. But we are terrified to do this because what we think to ourselves is if we are not watching out for what is good for us, no one else will. And so we try to protect ourselves and we protect what is good. And what we have to remember is that that statement is a lie. There is someone who watches out for our good. Even as we sacrifice for others. And that is the God of the universe. Verses 17 and 18 basically say that this was always Jesus' mission. It was always his mission 
to declare, to preach peace to those who are far off, that's the Gentiles, and to those who are near, that's the Jews. When it says for here in verse 18, it's really best to translate that with the result that. Jesus preached peace to those who are far off and those who are near with the result that through Jesus, both groups would have access in one spirit to the Father. The result of Jesus preaching peace to Jews and Gentiles is that everyone in Christ is empowered by the Holy Spirit to have access to the Father. The Father, the Holy Spirit and the cross allow us to have peace with God and that is all that is needed. There are no other walls that we have to climb. There are no walls of appearance. There are no walls of what we put on social media. There are no walls of who we voted for. There are no walls of whether we lift up our hands or don't lift up our hands in worship. These do not matter when it comes to peace with God and peace with one another. But yet we persist in building walls that say you're not welcome here because of how you look, what you write on social media, your political thinking, or how you worship. I hesitate in saying this, but I'm just going to say it. I did not pick those examples by accident. In my 20 years being a part of this church, I can give you specific names, stories of people who in this church were basically told you are not welcome here by someone else because of how they look, because of what they posted on social media, because of their political affiliation, because of how they worship. I am not saying that to shame us. I'm saying that to jar us into reality. And the reality is that this tendency to build walls where Jesus has torn them down runs incredibly deep inside every single one of us, including me. And the right response to that is not to make excuses. The right response to that is not to justify it. The only appropriate response is to repent before God for adding requirements to becoming a part of the people of God that God never added. We must repent of sin. But then what does Jesus always invite us to do? To believe. To believe that we are forgiven to believe that he is building the community, even of people who are different, and then to follow him, to follow him in loving one another with a sacrificial desire for unity with them and for their good. I am absolutely delighted that we have many people here at FBC who model this constantly for us, and we had a great example of it this past weekend, and it was already, it's already been alluded to with the fall retreat. We have a group of people in this church. It's called the Encore Ministry. Um, try, I'm still trying to figure out how to say this. Um, uh, they are people who are more advanced in experience than others. Um, There was a big dinner they had at this retreat. And the Encore Ministry said, we are going to do this for you. We are going to get in there and we are going to prepare this meal. We're going to provide this meal for the youth because we want to bless you. And you want to know something? If there's ever two groups in a church that's hard to bring together, it's two groups separated by generations. Because the music is different, the style of of dress is different, the politics are different, all of the appearances are different, preferences are different, but our encore group said, we are not going to define our unity 
based on those things, we are going to define our unity that we, like the youth, are in Christ. And because they did that, they said, we will sacrificially bless our youth. And you want to know the story I heard this morning from one of the Encore members? They were blown away by how what our youth did was to say, you are welcome here. Come sit with us. Talk to us. Let us help you. Let us serve you as as we clean up. I want to say Encore group, youth group, What you did is you have modeled for us what Paul is trying to say. Your unity does not come down to whether you look alike, think exactly alike, have the same preferences. The unity comes from the fact that you are in Christ. And we had that powerfully modeled for us this past weekend. Paul tells us we must lock into our thinking that we were once alienated, but now we have peaceful reconciliation. And then he ends this passage by showing the characteristics of the new community God is building. And these final verses in this this section explain the consequences of the union that we have with one another that God has formed in Christ. And first that he says that we are no longer strangers The word strangers is the word for foreigner. People from outside the country, people from outside the community, people who don't have the same same thought forms, the same language, the same customs, the same traditions. And then he says you are no longer aliens. This word for aliens refers to people who are resident aliens. People who are now living in the country. But they are still viewed as outsiders. And Paul's point is that you are no longer outsiders. And then he uses three pictures, three metaphors to show us what he means by that. He says that we are fellow citizens. This is a picture of the nation that God is building. And and he's saying that as fellow citizens, you both who were once outsiders and you who, who were Jews who were the people of God, you now have all the same rights and responsibilities. You share blessings, you share you share hopes. This is the exact opposite of when they were strangers. Then he says that they are part of the household, members of the household of God. This terminology in the the original audience would have brought up images of being blood relationships. This is God's family. There is an intimacy that exists in this community. It is the exact opposite of being a resident alien. These are people who now belong here. And then in the last verses, he creates this image of God building a holy temple. It is built on the truth that was taught by the apostles and the prophets. The cornerstone is Christ himself. What does that mean? The cornerstone was the first stone that was laid in a building. It was the most important stone that was set because everything else in the building structure was aligned according to that stone. And in verses 21 and 22, he says that the construction is still in process. And how it's happening is that we are being joined together. That is a fascinating concept that we cannot miss. They didn't use mortar to build buildings back then. What they did is they would take every stone and they would cut it. And then they would smooth it. And they would get it to the point that it exactly fit with the other stones around it. So it would come together into the building that they were trying to build. And what he is saying is that God is in the process of cutting each one of us. And smoothing each one of us. So that we fit exactly together into what? The dwelling place for God. People with the same rights, responsibilities, and blessings, intimately bound together, being shaped to fit exactly together as God's dwelling place. That is what our new community 
is to be light. I absolutely believe that it grieves God that we tend to define our salvation as being about me going to heaven when I die. Because that makes my salvation all about me. It's a true statement. That is part of our salvation. But you do not understand your salvation if you do not understand that a significant part of your salvation is that God has placed you in his people. And if you catch what these verses are saying, God does not just dwell in you as an individual believer, although that is true. Did you catch that we as a community are the dwelling place of God? We dwell, he dwells in us as a community of believers. So what does it mean for FBC to be a community of fellow citizens? It means that we do not see some as more inside and some as more outside. We don't keep some people at arm's length because of what they've said in social media. We don't treat a certain age group as them. Instead, we look at each person, even those we disagree with, and we affirm our commitment to their good and our unity with them. What does it mean for FBC to be an intimate household of God? It means that our ugliness is safe with one another. We will do and say stupid things. We'll do that on social media. We'll do it in emails. We'll do it in tweets. We'll do it in conversations. We are going to let one another down. We are going to hurt one another. We are going to disappoint one another. Guess what? All family members do. But the other thing that family members do is they see beyond one another's ugliness and they believe and hope the best about one another. And that is what it looks like for us to be a part of the household of God. What does it mean for FBC to be a community where the Holy Spirit is cutting and smoothing us to fit together? You won't like this one. It means that we don't hide when someone speaks the loving truth to us. We don't defriend someone who had the courage to stand in the way of our sin. We don't gossip about someone who loved us enough and trusted us enough to share their struggles and allowed us to speak truth into their lives. And here's the part you're not going to like. Do you have Someone in your life other than your spouse that you have invited in to honestly speak into your life. To honestly speak lovingly and say, stand in the way of my sin, even if it hurts to go there. What is Paul's picture in this passage? He is picturing a community that is not okay with building walls of hostility between one another. He is picturing a community that understand that peace does not come from being like one another. It comes from being like Jesus. He is picturing a community where the presence of God lives and is at work to fit us exactly together into a holy temple. And that is a temple that is worth marveling at. Paul's point in this passage is very simple. It is very straightforward. It is do not lose sight. Do not lose sight of the fact that God brought you near to him and he brought you near to one another. Frankenstein's creature did not start as a monster. He was given life and then he was left alone. He was rejected by those who should have shown him compassion. He was abandoned by those who should have guided him in life. And the emptiness inside of him had weight. And it became so heavy, so burdensome to carry, that it pulled him down in becoming a monster that struck out violently against all those who were around him. What a powerful picture of what it is to be alone of what happens to so many of us where the emptiness of loneliness overwhelms us. And we read this passage and we praise God that he did not leave us alone. He brought us near to him and he brought us near to one another. I want to suggest some responses 
that I think naturally come out of this passage. I haven't said this in a few weeks, but on the bulletin that you received, there is a place for you to indicate how, how is the Holy Spirit stirring you to respond to this passage? Maybe it's one of these things, maybe it's something else. And if you tear that off and drop it in one of the boxes in the foyer, we as a staff are going to pray for you that, that you would apply that and, and that the Holy Spirit would use that. But here are four suggestions. Uh, I suggest that you rewrite this passage in your own words. That's going to show up in every single one of these messages that I do because I really would love for you to engage with this, with this scripture so well that you're thinking in your own words, what does this mean? Ask someone to support you, to encourage you, to hold you accountable as you seek to mend a broken relationship. If there's anything that comes out of this passage is that we are not meant to, to live the Christian life alone. Allow the brothers and sisters in Christ that God has given you to support you and encourage you. I read a passage like this and I think there is repenting that I need to do. There have been times that I have built dividing walls or have just allowed dividing walls to stand between me and other Christians. And the only appropriate response to that is before the Lord is to repent. But then the other follow-up response to that is the practice is to take a step toward removing the hostility with someone. Maybe that's just reaching out to someone and saying, can we get coffee? Maybe it's just saying, you know, I, I, think, I think I kind of blasted you on Facebook. And I want you to know that I'm sorry. And I'm not going to define you by that. Please don't define me by what I did. What can we do to take a step? The song that we're going to close with challenges with the truth that we have been trying to get our minds around all year. The way that it is known that we are Christ's disciples is in how we love one another. And this passage fits right into that. So can we join together and sing let us be known by her love. Let us be known by our love in every word and every deed honor the sun let our light shine in every Let us be known by our love for the glory of the Father, for the glory of the Son. For the glory of the Spirit, let us be known by our love, and let us be Let us be 
Invite the prayer team to come forward. These folks are here to pray with you, no matter what you're dealing with. But we certainly want to pray with you and make sure that you know the Savior who brings peace. This is what we have said about God this morning. We have said that God pursued us with love to reconcile us to Him and to one another. He has not abandoned us to be alone. So what do we do with this being true about our God? We leave here and we do not settle for the dividing walls that divide us. We pursue one another in love. You are dismissed to go do that as you leave here. Thank you for being here this morning.